Hey YouTube, welcome back to Intuition. Once again, it's me, Leo, and today I'm going to be talking to you guys about thermodynamics. Stay tuned. So today we're going to be answering thermodynamics questions. Uh, I think this is a really good topic because it's a very broad, it's a very broad and generalizable topic. So it can apply from anything from physics to chemistry to biology. Everything uh, obeys the laws of thermodynamics. In fact, Albert Einstein says that um, he doesn't know of any laws that are more secured and more unbreakable than the laws of thermodynamics. So. If it was good enough for Einstein, it should be good enough for you. And I think that you should definitely know it. All right, so today, let's answer three questions. All right, so let's take a look at question number one. Question number one says, an engine operates between 127 degrees Celsius and 227 degrees Celsius. Determine its maximum theoretical efficiency. So this is a very straightforward question. First thing we want to do is we want to make sure that we understand what the question is asking. So that way we can know what we have to do to figure out the answer. The question says that we have an engine and it's operating between two temperatures, uh, a high temperature of 227 degrees Celsius and a low temperature of 127 degrees Celsius. And the machine is basically going to be using this temperature gradient, high temperature operating between high temperature and low temperature to generate work and to cause some motion, right? Cause something to happen. Whether it's like moving a train or running the computer, it doesn't matter, right? It's gonna do some work so that way you can get something out of it. Energy flows from high to low, right? So heat flows from hot to cold. You're going to be using the high temperature, the 227 degrees Celsius, and you're going to be taking the energy from that hot temperature so that could be that's your that's your main energy driver and your energy supplier so that will be like basically your furnace if you take a look at old school steam engine trains um, the energy supplier was coal right they would burn coal boil the water and create steam and that hot steam will be the driver for the engine it's, it's the same concept here we have an we have a machine and the simplest machine i can think of is basically an ideal gas operating within a piston why an ideal gas because within an ideal gas, there is no intermolecular interaction. So all the energy that you give to the ideal gas can be directly converted into useful work. The molecules within an ideal gas are basically just moving around, uh, bumping into each other, translating energy to each other, but there's no electrical forces acting between the molecules of an ideal gas. And basically all the energy that they have is purely kinetic. And whenever you have purely kinetic energy, you can easily transfer that into work and make something happen. So if you have an ideal gas within a piston, if you give it some heat, the molecules within the gas, they move faster and they'll expand. As the gas expands, the piston moves and the movement of that piston can be converted into work. As the piston moves, it can cause the gears of your machine or your train, whatever it is that you're operating, it can cause those gears to move and give you useful work. So we know that the hot temperature, that the higher temperature, the hot temperature is what is supplying us the energy to do the work. Now you would ask, well, what's the purpose of the lower temperature? Well, let's take a look at Carnot's engine. So Carnot's engine is a perfect example of an ideal engine because it uses an ideal gas to generate work and it operates under purely equilibrium conditions and it also operates between a high temperature and a low temperature. So if you take a look at Carnot's engine, it's the same concept that we just discussed. At the beginning of the Carnot engine, you have your ideal gas at the high temperature and as heat flows from your furnace into your piston, the ideal gas expands and the piston expands. As the piston expands, you generate work and you're able to move your gears and run your machine. Now, here's the problem. The piston can only expand so much. If you're gonna keep getting work out of this machine, you're gonna have to go around the cycle. The piston is gonna have to expand, do work, contract again, expand, do work, contract again, expand, do work, and so on. It's gonna have to repeat the cycle over and over to constantly generate work. As the piston expands and generate works, that's good. That's the easy part, but how do we get back? Well, in order to get back and repeat the cycle, 
we're going to have to lower the temperature of the gas. We're going to have to lower the temperature of the gas in order to make it easier for us to contract the gas and get it back to its initial condition. Because if we don't lower the temperature of the gas, the gas is gonna overheat and it's gonna be hard for us to compress. This is basically common experience. If you ever had like boil water with the cover on, as the water heats up and as the water gets hotter, you notice that the, the lid starts to like jump up and down because now it's harder for the lid to stay on top of the hot water, the hot steam, because the steam wants to expand. So if we keep the steam hot, it's harder for us to contract it. And basically the same amount of work that we got out of the steam, we're gonna have to put right back in to contract the steam. And that's useless. We want to get net, we want to get net work out of this machine. We want to heat this machine up, get it hot, get it to expand, give it some work, cool it down, shrink it back to its initial volume, and then heat it up again, do some work, cool it down, shrink it back down again, and so on, and repeat that cycle over and over. And in order to do that, we're gonna have to operate between not just the hot temperature that gives us the work, but the low temperature to cool it down, to get it back to its initial condition to repeat the cycle. All right, I hope that makes sense for you guys. Now, here is the unfortunate part of operating between the high temperature and the low temperature. After we, after we have expanded the gas, when we cool down the gas and contract it, unfortunately, we have to give up some heat. Remember, because we can't keep the gas real hot because then it's gonna be hard to compress it back to its initial condition. So unfortunately, we have to bring the gas down to lower temperature and the heat from the gas is gonna have to flow into the lower temperature reservoir. And that's the sucky part about it because it would be nice for us to be able to keep that heat to generate to generate work, but we're gonna have to give up some heat. And that's basically where the inefficiency of the Carnot engine comes from. Is that once we understand that, this becomes a very easy question for us to answer. The hot temperature will give us a, a certain amount of heat. T1 is gonna give us an amount of heat, Q1. And what's the amount of heat that we lose as we go back around? is gonna be proportionate to the temperature of the colder reservoir. We have to remember that the heat flow is directly proportional to the temperature. To measure the efficiency of this engine, we just need to look at the difference between the energy that we, we gain and the energy that we lost, divided by the amount of energy that we gain. The temperature is, is the defining variable that tells us the energy of the gas. The higher the temperature of the gas, the more energy it has. But we have to be careful because it's a specific type of temperature that will actually tell us the the actual energy of the gas. And that temperature is the temperature in Kelvin, not Celsius, right? Measuring temperature in Kelvin is on an is on an absolute scale. We want to actually use the temperature in Kelvin, not the temperature in Celsius, all right? Cool. So now to measure the maximum efficiency out of this engine, we know that the efficiency is going to be equal to, we take the difference between the, temper between the energy we gain versus the energy we lost. On what energy, what was the energy we gained? We gained energy Q1 from the hot temperature T1, right? And we lost energy Q2 that we gave up to temperature T2, right? And then we divide that by the total amount of energy that we had to begin with, which was Q1. Okay, and then that will be our maximum efficiency of this engine. Now, remember that the energy is directly proportional to the temperatures. We can simply replace these energy terms, these Qs, with their temperatures because they're directly proportional. So Q1 is directly proportional to T1. So I'm just gonna replace that with T1. Q2 is directly proportional to T2. So I'm gonna replace that with T2. over T1. Okay, and that will give us our answer, right? Because now we take the difference between between the temperatures, which is a 100 degrees Celsius. The difference between temperatures are the same in Celsius or Kelvin scale, right? Because it's the difference. So the difference between 127 and 227 is 100. So we have, so the difference between these two temperatures is 100. But uh, Kelvin, and then I'm gonna divide that by T1, but I'm gonna convert T1 into Kelvin. And how do you convert Celsius to Kelvin? You just add 273, right? So that would be 273 plus 27. And what does that equal? That equals 0 0.2. How do we convert, and we convert that to percentage? We just multiply by 100, and that gives us 20%, right? 
And that's how you do this problem. Easy. Now let's go on to question number two. Okay. Question number two states, during a thermodynamic process, 400 joules of heat are added to a gas, while 300 joules of work are done by the gas on its surroundings. Determine the change in internal energy. Okay, very straightforward problem. Basically, it's similar to the first problem that we did. Okay, so this is a very straightforward problem. This gas took in 400 joules of heat and it did 300 joules of work. So it lost, so you took in 400, but you lost 300. What was the change in internal energy? Well, what's the difference between 400 and 300? 100, right? So very easy, answer is B. Okay, easy. So let's take a look at question three. Question three states, the entropy of an isolated system, which undergoes a natural process and evolves towards equilibrium, A is zero, B is equal to one, C, it never decreases, D, it always remains constant, E, always increases. Okay, this problem is very easy as long as you remember your three laws of thermodynamics, right? What are your three laws of thermodynamics? Law number one, heat flows from hot to cold. Law number one. What's law number two? Law number two of thermodynamics, energy is conserved. Energy can be converted from one form to another, but energy is always conserved. And what's the third law of thermodynamics? The third law of thermodynamics is that entropy is always increasing. We have to pay a price to get things done. And, to pay, and the price that we have to pay to get things done is that entropy has to go up. Disorder, chaos has to increase. Okay, so the answer to this question is very straightforward. The answer is E, it always increases. Entropy will always increase until it gets to equilibrium. And then what happens to ent entropy at equilibrium? It stays constant. Change in entropy at equilibrium is zero, which by the way, you should know that for the Carnot cycle, for the Carnot engine, the reason why the Carnot engine is the most efficient type of engine is that the entropy change, is that the change in entropy is equal to zero. Why? Because the Carnot engine operates at equilibrium through the entire cycle. So if you, if you remain at equilibrium, the change in entropy will be equal to zero, if you stray away from equilibrium, the entropy will increase. And that is basically a law of nature and something that you should definitely know. It's a broad concept and uh, you can apply that to chemistry, biology, uh, any other science that, that you're interested in. So I hope that was helpful. If you have any questions, leave it in the comment section below. Keep watching, keep learning. As always, be easy. Bye-bye.